Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a video that's all about the Italian books that are on my TBR. And I personally thought I had more <laughs> modern books on this list, but I think there's only really one book that's been published in the past 50 years that's on my TBR. Uh, and so this is actually just really a list of Italian classics that are on my physical TBR. I thought I would go over some of my favorites that I have read, and then we can go into my list of books that are still on my TBR. And just because I don't name them here doesn't mean that they're not somewhere on my kind of ethereal TBR. It just means that I don't own a copy. I have a shelf on Goodreads that is just called Italy, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the authors are Italian. It honestly just means that a book is set in Italy, or it was written by an Italian author. And so it's not really that great of a shelf for me when I am thinking about reading Italian writers. And so that's basically what this video is all about and how I just want to prioritize in the future reading more from truly Italian authors. I really love when anything is set in Italy, but I find that I just get so much out of reading Italian fiction. And so I'm also not going to mention any nonfiction here, though I have read quite a bit of classic nonfiction from Italy and I have really enjoyed it. I think the only thing here that is nonfiction that I wanted to make note of is a book that I kind of forgot I owned. And so I brought it down here essentially so that I could tell y'all about it and you could help me not to forget that I own it. But let's go on and get into this. I have read several Italian works that I just truly loved. I think the majority of these that I have sitting here, I've given five stars. I forgot to bring down Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. That's a more modern book as well, which I just adored and I gave five stars to. That's more of a modern book, but I feel like it's going to skew into the realm of a classic if it's not already, I believe my edition is actually published by Vintage, so it's definitely something that people are perceiving as a modern classic currently, uh, but I loved that. Five stars. I truly don't think we can talk about Italian fiction or Italy in general on my channel without mentioning Dante. So I feel like Dante can't have been my first introduction to Italian classics or just in general Italian literature. I feel like there's no way that he was my introduction, but maybe it's true. Maybe he really was. Uh, and so I personally love everything I've read by Dante, not just the Divine Comedy. I love a collection of his poetry that's known as La Vida Nuova. But this is truly the greatest of all of those that I have read, in my opinion. It's basically my favorite work of all time. Uh, I just truly think this is masterful. This is a piece of epic poetry, the Divine Comedy. Uh, and so Dante is a poet. And I think a lot of what's on my TBR actually is Italian poetry because I have so thoroughly enjoyed it uh, in years past. So this is kind of the top of my list in general. This is my favorite Italian work. Uh, and it is just in general, I think my favorite work of all time. We also have The Liberation of Jerusalem, which is another epic poem, and this time it's from the Renaissance. So Dante was writing in the medieval period. This is a uh, Renaissance work from the late 1500s. And I picked this up a few years ago, mostly because when I heard about it, I knew I instantly had to have it. But I picked it up when I was working on a Napoleon project in 2021, where my ultimate goal was to read books the entire year that surrounded Napoleon. And I really specifically wanted to read books that were on his reading list. And The Liberation of Jerusalem is one of his favorite books. I read this in a vlog where I read, I think, his other favorite novels. This was fantastic, and I am so glad that I picked it up for that project. This was truly stunning. This is an epic poem that takes place during the First Crusade, and I think it just has so many interesting nuanced layers to the characterization, and the language is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's just truly beautiful, dreamy, it is insane to me that this just was birthed from one man's mind. I feel like I'm due for a reread of this because I think reading it in a vlog meant that I rushed through it in some places and I definitely like to take my time more with epic poetry. Uh, so this is certainly one that I really would like to come back to. 
We then have the last letters of Jacopo Ortis by Ugo Foscolo. This is a work from uh, the Romantic period. This was published in the early 1800s after the Napoleonic era, surprisingly enough. Uh, and I really enjoyed the writing of this. I don't want to say that I enjoyed this book. This is a very heavy novel uh, that is in the same vein as The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe. And if you have read that, then you know what this book deals with. It deals with some pretty heavy topics. Uh, it deals with depression, mental illness. It is very, very heavy. But because it was written during the Romantic period, it is also gorgeously written. And there are so many wonderful scenes where we're just getting descriptions of nature and of the scenery that are stunning to me. And what I really liked is that often Romanticism will focus on truly nature. But this book also kind of talked about the beauty of the city and of architecture, which I really enjoyed. Ugo Foscolo is more broadly known, I think, as a poet. And so I definitely would love to try Sepulchres, which I think is his most famous work. I don't have a collection of his poetry, but I would really like to get one. It seems like a couple of years ago when I first heard about him as an author, it was fairly difficult to get a more recent translation of him, and you almost certainly couldn't have gotten it printed, uh, which I just think is kind of bizarre, really. But I have seen it floating around, so I know there's a copy out there. Uh, so I would really like to try more from Ugo Foscolo. I think based on his prose writing, I would probably really enjoy his poetry. We're kind of just gradually moving forward in time here. This is so interesting. Uh, but we have Pleasure by Gabriella D'Annunzio, which I adored. This is kind of a later 19th century novel, and it is truly, again, dreamily written. This also feels like it's kind of in conversation with the Romantic movement more broadly, uh, but it's also just a very interesting glimpse into kind of the Risorgimento period of Italy when Italy is reunifying. So I think this book is really layered. I think you can get a lot out of this novel, but it's very erotic, it's very sexy. And that meant that for a very long time, English translations of it were pretty sanitized and were not at all uh, true to what the original was. And so I think they've said this is kind of uh, the first English translation that's really true to what pleasure is as a novel in the Italian language, which I think is really fascinating. He talks a lot about Shelley and Byron in this book. That's kind of why I like it, but I also just thought that the descriptions were decadent. This was just like eating a really rich dessert, just a genuine pleasure, no pun intended, to read. I also forgot to bring down somehow the Decameron. I am going to put the Decameron and this next book that we talk about, I'm going to put them in the same category that is kind of currently reading or DNF'd. I unintentionally DNF'd the Decameron last year. I started reading it in March. It was my March of the Mammoths pick, I believe. And there is just something about the episodic nature of the Decameron that means when I put it down, I am not all that interested in picking it back up. I struggle with short story compilations for that reason. I really struggle with anthologies. Anything that kind of closes the door on one story before moving on to another means that my investment in it is probably not that high. And so I think stylistically, the Decameron was always going to be a pretty hard sell for me, and I've known that. I was really enjoying it. The Decameron is often compared to uh, the Canterbury Tales in English, which I hated in school. I really did hate Chaucer. And so anytime anything is compared to Chaucer, I'm a little bit nervous because I just recall viscerally disliking the Canterbury Tales. I didn't have that same problem with Boccaccio. I think he's really funny, but I think he's also very interesting socially, and I think he was having a lot of really important discussions, and he did it through humor, but it was never over the top for me. So certainly I need to get back to the Decameron. Please encourage me in the comments below if you've read it. I know a lot of people just absolutely adore it, and maybe the way to go for me, just to make me fully commit to it, would be to read it on audio. The other book that is in my currently reading section is kind of the book that inspired this video. It's a book that I am completely obsessed with right now. I am reading The Canzoniere by Petrarch. I love this. Once again, more poetry. Who am I? Petrarch 
Boccaccio and Dante are all semi-contemporaries. Dante is a little bit older than Petrarch and Boccaccio, but Petrarch and Boccaccio were friends. They lived together at one time. It's really incredible. And so it's really interesting to read each work by Dante, Boccaccio, and by Petrarch and see how they're all kind of weirdly in conversation uh, because they're all tied together by the city of Florence and by just in general the times in which they're living. The 1300s was a crazy time all around, but it certainly was in Italy. So this is Petrarch's collection of poems that he wrote across 40 years. And they are all about Laura, his muse, who was a woman he met at church one day. And she sadly died during the plague. She died in 1348 from the plague. So this is really a great example of love poetry and it's Petrarch kind of creating his own style of sonnet, which we still call the Petrarchan sonnet. This is gorgeous. I really cannot stress to you enough how beautiful this is. This is one of my favorite things that I have read this year and I have read so many great five stars, but truly this is a masterpiece, and I'm so sad that this is just a selection of the Canzoniere. I wish that they had just given us the whole thing because, wow, this book is the challenge. This is a book that I'm trying to challenge myself with because the Italian is on one side and the English is on the other, and I'm trying to make myself read the Italian before I try the English. It just doesn't really go well for me. I know it's certainly older Italian, but... I am so literal when I'm trying to translate these things. It's hilarious. The words that I do recognize, I go so literal with, and I just kind of ignore tense. It's really difficult, but I've been trying to challenge myself there, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think that might be part of why I am just loving this so much, because I can tell an Italian that it is as beautiful as the translation is. I feel like I'm in really good hands with the translator, so this is my current Italian read. Stunning. Now let's get into my kind of Italian TBR. There is only one book that is more modern, so I say let's get that out of the way first. I think this is probably eventually going to be talked about as a modern classic, similar to Name of the Rose, and that is My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. So I started this, you can see, and I feel like I was flying through it. I feel like it was really easy to read. I just don't know if the story is for me. I think this just felt like it was going to drag. It felt like it was going to be very slow. And I know a lot of people say not to judge this series, the Neapolitan series, on this first book. You need to read all four in the cycle before you can finally get the whole entire picture and judge it as a whole. But I really kind of struggled with this, so I DNF'd it. I guess this should technically have been in my DNF pile. I would love to know your opinions on this down below. Is this something I should commit to? Should I really carry on with this? Uh, I do want to watch the show because we have it available to us here in the States through HBO and it's in Italian. I really want to watch it to help me learn Italian. It's helpful to me to hear a language being spoken and so I think it would be helpful for me to watch the show, but I would like to have read the books before I do that. This did skew more literary, but I feel like I'm in a better place now. I feel like I'm more of a literary reader than I used to be, so I think maybe this could work for me. Again, please tell me your opinions on this and on all of these down below. We have kind of a rogue one here, so this is Iris Arrigo's The Merchant of Prado. And I picked this up the last time I was in Florence. I picked this up uh, in October last year. And I went into an Italian bookstore and I just assumed, based on Iris Arrigo's name, that she actually was Italian. But I think she is an American that moved to Italy. She might be of Italian background, but essentially this work is where she went through the archives and she has reconstructed someone's entire life from their papers. So it is a novel, it's a historical fiction, but I don't actually know whether this counts because again, I think the author is truly American and not Italian. And there you go. There's my ticket to Santa Croce, tucked in between the pages. Isn't that stunning? This is Giotto.
I am really interested in this because I think it's going to be quite fascinating. This is set during kind of the same time I think that Petrarch was living. I do think it's going to deal a little bit more with numbers because it seems like he was kind of into banking as a merchant. And so I just am intrigued by this, but hearing that it says daily life in a medieval Italian city, I do wonder just how gripping it's going to be. Again, maybe I shouldn't have included this here because maybe it doesn't count, but I picked this up in Italy and it's about an Italian historical figure. It was written in Italy, so I'm gonna count it. I think the elephant in the room for me is uh, something that I am often recommended by my Italian subscribers, and I know, <laughs> y'all, I'm gonna get to this. I know I would love it. Everyone tells me to read The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, and I am going to get there. I personally just don't really like the text in this edition. Look at this. It's just so old looking in my opinion and it's not very friendly to the eyes, but I think this is the most modern translation of it. This was written in the middle of the 19th century and it is also in many ways in conversation with the Romantic movement. Alessandro Manzoni is a figure in the Italian Romanticism movement and this is historical fiction that is set in the 1600s in Milan. I am really intrigued by this because a lot of people talk about how sweeping it is in terms of romance and just how beautiful the language is. I know I'm going to love this and I think that's why I've put it off, but it's also really rather large. I'm very intrigued by this, mostly because this edition has no notes. It barely has an introduction. I just think it's wild. Truly, I do. I think this is a really bizarre edition of a Penguin classic because I just don't think they went to the lengths with this one that they do with most of their selections. Uh, and so I'm excited by this, but I do think it's probably gonna take me a long time to get through. That's why I haven't picked it up prior to now. There's also another elephant in the room, sorry. That's Orlando Furioso. This is one that I have tried before, so I guess I should also have called this a DNF. I feel like I would probably really enjoy this in a different edition, the edition that I picked up, I got this used, so I was just thrilled to find it, but it does translate this epic poem. This is an epic poem. It translates it into prose, which is a pet peeve of mine. And I just, in general, going back to the text, don't think this is very readable because the text is so small. They did what they could, in my opinion, to make sure that they could keep this work contained in one volume so that they didn't have to split it, which is what I believe Penguin does. And I can understand why they would have wanted to do that. I understand why they translated it into prose to save space, but it just is not very user-friendly in my opinion, and the text is way too small. And so I told myself if I read this, I'm probably only going to read it once in my life. And I think I would like to read it as poetry, as verse, and not as prose. But I know a lot of people love this and they prefer it to the liberation of Jerusalem. I will be the judge of that because I don't think anything can beat that. Speaking of books that I picked up the last time I was in Italy, I picked up Rime by Guido Cavalcanti. I also got this in the same exact store that I got The Merchant of Prado in. And this is in Italian. <laughs> so that's why it is still on my TBR. I felt decent about my Italian the last time that I went, and I felt really good about reading signs, reading maps. I felt really, really good about reading while there. And normally I would tell you, I think my ear is better than my eye. I think I can understand it better when it's spoken than when it's written down. And so I know that's a weakness for me. And I just got this for a wide variety of reasons. I thought it would be great to practice my Italian, but also, I know I'm gonna love Guido Cavalcanti. Guido Cavalcanti is another contemporary of Dante because I'm obsessed with Dante. So I'm just kind of moving around his circle of influence. Guido Cavalcanti was also a poet. That's what Rime means, rhymes. And this is all in Italian. It's gonna take me a really long time to get through, but these editions were just gorgeous. These Italian poetry editions, and I wish I had gotten several more of them because just look at how wonderful the text is and like the space for me to write my notes. They knew it. They also write down here like a more modern Italian translation of this because uh, this is older Italian. It was written in the 1300s, late 1200s, early 1300s. So it's a little bit more archaic 
It's still readable, in my opinion, because I'm reading that Petrarch right now, and I don't think it's that different, but I appreciate them doing this because there are words where meanings have changed, and there's kind of like updated spelling and everything, so this is really, really valuable. Look at the imagery here. There's Orson Michele. That is my favorite church in Florence. It is almost never open. I just am always wondering about this, but Orson Michele, gorgeous. Look at that. I can't believe we're getting all these images. I wonder if he went to Orson Michele. Maybe that was his favorite church as well. And then here's another ticket. I know you were, you were desperate to see this. This is also from Santa Croce. So this must be my mom's ticket. This will take me a very long time to get through, but I'm personally really excited about it. I love these editions. I just think they're so awesome and floppy. I wish we had more like this in English. And I just adore the Botticelli on the cover. I'm wearing my Botticelli shirt because we were gonna be talking about Italy, it felt appropriate. I think I also picked this up in Italy. It's The Tartar Step by Dino Buzzati. This is a more modern classic, which once again, all of my Italian subscribers have told me to read. This is often recommended to me, and so I feel like it's got to be a shoe in I'm going to definitely love this just based on how many times it has been recommended to me over the years. This is much shorter than what it looks because they have spaced the text out, interestingly, but I just know that this is a more modern classic. I know almost nothing about it, and I kind of want to keep it that way. A lot of people tend to rate this as one of their favorites. And here we go again. Here is something else. This is from Salvatore and Ognissanti. So this is where Botticelli is buried and that is a Botticelli painting. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, so I ha already have bookmarks in these, so I'm prepared. I think I actually started reading this, if you want to know. I think I started reading this the second that I got it. Uh, and so I am interested, I'm intrigued by this. I'm gonna save this, I think, for the late summer, early autumn, but I would really like to get to this this year. The last thing is kind of my rogue nonfiction. This technically is a nonfiction, but when I was looking over my shelves earlier and trying to pull out everything that had to do with Italy and Italian authors, I could not believe that I found this. I apparently found this used, and this is the uh, complete like notebooks of Michelangelo, and it includes his poetry, so I thought I could cheat and include it here uh, because Michelangelo did it all. He had to write poetry too. But it's just a really beautiful edition of his notebooks. It includes his illustrations. Is that not amazing? What is that? Ideal head of a woman, I should think it is. That is stunning. This includes letters that he wrote to the Pope. He worked for the Pope for a time. That's why he was doing the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and it's so interesting to read his thoughts. I love Michelangelo. I'm so basic. I'm so basic, but I love Michelangelo. Who doesn't? And so this is something I would like to work my way through. Again, I think this is something that would take a very long time to read because I really enjoy reading people's journals. I enjoy reading notebooks and everything, but they do tend to slow me down because I feel like I need to be taking notes. I need to be making note of certain things. This is going to have a lot there. It's going to have not just his artwork and his sketches and not just his journal entries, but it's going to have his poetry. And so this is kind of comprehensive. It's going across his entire life because Michelangelo was always writing stuff down. So I think this will be a very, very interesting peek into his life. I feel like I should have more than that on my physical TBR, but I know that there are so many things that I just have on my TBR on Goodreads, things like the Viceroys, which I know I would love. Uh, there are so many different things. The Leopard. I would love to know down below if you have read any of these, what your opinion of them is, and also just in general, what your favorite Italian books are. What would you recommend? Uh, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.